So this week I had the opportunity to go on a podcast run by a fellow Sandia National Laboratories employee, Thaddeus Preston. His podcast is called The Armenian Council for Truth in Journalism. And uh, we had a good conversation with him and his friends over there. And uh, I think it's worth the watch. I would typically tell you to watch the entire thing here. But if you want to, you can jump down to the description right now and go see the full hour-long version there. I just cut up about 15 minutes of it, put some highlights in here. Um, there's still a lot of good content over there. I recommend going over, sending them some love, su subscribing to their channel and their podcast, wherever their, their podcast is held. But you can certainly subscribe to their YouTube channel, which I'll send you over to. And I just have to say that their intro music is pretty epic. So the audio um, I, want, I well just want to define what critical race theory is here because a lot of people are yeah, listening and this right. might be the first time they're hearing critical race theory and we're talking about it. And uh, critical race theory is essentially, if you've heard about this uh, push for calling saying all of our institutions are systemically racist and talking about white privilege, critical race theory is the uh, theory that's behind and pushing all this. And the core tenet of critical race theory is saying that race is at play in every single human interaction. It looks at the entire world through the, through the lens of race. And in addition to that, one of the things that these books and materials bring into critical race theory is uh, intersectionality. And Kimberly Crenshaw is the mother of intersectionality and intersectionality is essentially where critical race theory and feminism cross where they meet and it's bringing those two ideas together and in these books uh, kimberly crenshaw is probably the most quoted uh individual in all of these books that ties everything together because when they talk about race they talk about it with uh, in the lines of race and gender and essentially looking at the whole world through this identitarianism uh style style lens and so critical race theory is just um is taking this to in a very extreme. I was just going to say, having read all of these different books, I mean, what is your attitude about the authors? You mentioned that you, you thought that the majority of them were very genuine in what they had to say. Now, when you say the majority of them, do you think that some of these authors aren't so genuine and they are just pushing this in order to divide people and, you know, kind of bring about their goals? What's, what's your take after reading some of these books? I guess when I when I say that, I said um, I, I believe they're sincere in their experiences, and it's because I'm not going to sit here and attribute their motives to them. If they say tell me their motives, I'll just accept them. I don't need to argue about their motives. And obviously, uh, I think the best thing people can do is actually take some of these most popular books, even take this this book list that I had in my video, and go look up the most popular one on Amazon and find out what it is and and read that book because you can make up your own mind. Obviously, I don't, I don't, I truly don't believe all of them are sincere. I think some of them are extremely divisive. They see their place. They make a lot of money off of this. They know how destructive it is. I don't think they're stupid, but I don't want to yeah. sit here and attribute motives to all of them. Cause I, then you're sitting there arguing with somebody about somebody's motives, what they're thinking about. And that that's not beneficial to anybody. So even if I concede the fact that they're sincere in their hopes and in their intentions, I can sure. easily point out sure. that their results are absolutely failing. Their results do not match their intentions at all. And so I can argue from that standpoint and just avoid the argument of, are they sincere? Are, are they um, trying to destroy or take over anything? Or I don't know and I don't care. I just know that this is what the results are and it has no place in a federally funded national laboratory and it has no place in a lot of other institutions in, in the United States. And I guess we are seeing now this make it, has made its way into K through 12 education. Allow me then to be the one that's going to sit back and make that point that basically it is intentional. <laughs> because here's the deal. <laughs> I will use my black privilege to basically say that like they need to stop helping us with theories like that. Period. All right. <laughs> Having seen the fact that the that the National Laboratory is basically pushing this behind the scenes, makes people like myself, who are people of color who work for the National Laboratories, question whether or not we would even should I've gotten promoted I've gotten? Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Am I actually good enough? Yeah. This, 
to, to, to say that like um, I'm that I'm that guy that basically took too many red pills, and to say that it is not intentional is 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 to me is is, is silly because it is very yeah. intentional. Why? Because I believe in really the the you know there's three types of people in this world: they're useful idiots, the true believers, and they're Spengali's. And I think obviously that while I understand why maybe critical race theory should be a critical look at the history of the United States and the things that we've done, ultimately you must understand that it is a divisive mechanism for bringing this social change about period and i and like i don't you know i don't give thought enemies the benefit of the doubt i know what they're trying to do i am i am i i come from a community where they were doing you know this for our benefit and i i've seen the destructive nature of what they've done and these people do yeah. not have good intentions i'm sorry right uh, unfortunately this I, I understand the critical theory of critical race theory. Anyone who's you know learned enough and studied in college understands that yeah, maybe just maybe, then yeah, then maybe just maybe that yeah, there, there's a history of something. But to say, and as you've said yourself, to then look at the history of something and then fast forward a hundred years and be like, ah, well, it's still the same. It's like, well, no, 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 no. You skipped a hundred years of progress um, that yeah. we had long before this. Uh, I, I I am I am I am a believer in diversity and and I am in an interracial family and I'm in all these other things and I've worked in these environments. I even I was in the military. We you know it, there, nothing nothing more bonds people together than a common enemy or being shot at. And so like to come back <laughs> to the real cool. world where people have now now looked at now look at these per, these perceived grievances and suddenly like now we must rip society apart and critically look at all the societal institutions that's the church that's this you know that's that's policing that's that's the family that's all that stuff but they never critically look at things like education or the state and and that's why i'm just like no i know this is on purpose even if even if the useful idiots teach this and say we we, we, we make our workforce you know more diverse yeah. you're 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 reinstituting racial quotas in hiring, you're reinstituting racial quotas and gender quotas and all yeah. kinds of these other things. And maybe but this gets see, me in trouble, but I'm thinking this is not what we want. This is not what we went to these godforsaken war zones and fought for, <laughs> and only to come back, raise a multiracial family, to be told that, yeah, your kids have no chance, so we won't probably give them some quotas and stuff like that. That is the most, uh, that is the most insulting, infantilizing thing that I could, you could possibly do to a people. And all you have to do is look at the history yeah. of infantilizing people like that, to notice, to, to, to see the things. I mean, the African-American community doesn't need to be catered to. Again, as Jason Riley wrote in his book, stop helping us, right? <laughs> You're not helping us. You're making yeah. my job very uncomfortable when I have any conversation with people I work with. Yeah. And I would say uh, one of the things that's preached a lot, uh, even uh, was it Ibram Kennedy, I think, uh, said um, he wrote the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And they say you need yeah. to be an anti-racist. It's not enough to be not racist. And the fact is, I think everybody I know, uh, all my family and friends are anti-racist. They were anti-racist and have always been anti-racist. But the fact is what they are pushing is not anti-racism. It is selective racism. Yeah. And they are telling you how to be racist. And then they have this very belittling tone they take with the minority African-American community. And even, of course, with the um, when you bring intersectionality into it with the females, uh, women and telling them that they can't possibly accomplish as much as the their white counterparts. They couldn't possibly because the system is against them and preaching this victimhood and then taking this very belittling tone as if like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you what you need. Here's affirmative action so you can get a job, so you can get a promotion. Here is the, it's the whole idea of white savior. So you it's exactly. The, it's the same old. I'm trying not to just tear off. This is progressivism. This is white word, progressivism but... that has been forever. Yeah, yeah. This is this has been the this has been the case for the progressive, particularly the let's help uh, let's let's help the um, POCs or people of color progressives for the last fifty plus years. Um, <laughs> affirmative action, all right, had its had its uses, had its purposes, but like I think I think we're taking it to an extreme now. I think we need to stop yeah. this. Um, we don't need to. I mean, and the and the fact of the matter is 
that, that, that there's a uh, FFD, uh, FFDRC or FFRDC that is like pushing this. I mean, it, it, and, and thank God people like yourself have brought this stuff up. And Senator Joss Hawley, who I, I'm not really a big fan of, actually kind of brought this to the forefront. Now we have an actual order coming from OMB that said, or, or a letter coming from OMB like, hey, we're not going to fund this anymore. And they shouldn't because you're built, you're destroying, to use my military terms, unit cohesion when you introduce these things. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see what they do with this uh, this order because we are technically a contractor, right? But we are almost right. entirely funded by the, the government. So I really don't know what the lab's going to do with it. I'm assuming that they, they understand. I think they'll the fudge the money. <laughs> I think they'll fudge the money. I think that I think that I think I think the end test side can get away with it. It's just the money. It depends on how they color the money. And like they'll color the end test side money, yeah. right? Like the pure Honeywell money. And it'll probably be like, oh, yeah, we're going to send our executives off to these resorts up north and like brainwash them about how terrible they are. And then also so, like the rank and file employees can opt in or out one way or the other, but we can't use federal funds. That's what I think. I have right. other videos queued up ready to go. Like I had um, other people speaking out and I was about, we were about to put out another video from an individual that left the laboratories. He wrote a scathing letter, a resignation letter, and then he was told by his friends to moderate it. So he sent them the, the moderated sanitized version of that. And he sent the real letter to me and I was about okay. to go forward with that. And I mean, it's, it's a, I think it's nearly a 20 minute video all said and done. And so it's a long letter and it, it is, uh, but I took a lot of this material. And I said, okay, let's hold up and see what our national laboratory does with this because yeah. I don't need to keep, you know, pushing this if they're going to make the correct changes here moving forward. But if they don't, if they don't change anything, absolutely. Uh, this, this continues. And uh, we have a lot larger movement behind this. People have woken up to the fact that this garbage is in the laboratory and they are not just going to go back to sleep. If they decide to keep pushing forward with this, it is going to get extremely uncomfortable. My hope is that you would see some pushback in the private sector, because I guarantee this is happening in the private sector, probably more. And it's because there's this huge push where everybody wants to look like they're not racist, like their corporation's doing better than the next one. You know, it's obviously, in some people's opinions, a problem within the NBA, within professional sports in general, where it's almost become like this giant virtue signal to always put a guy's name on the helmet, to put a guy's name on the court, whatever it takes. And I don't even know how much sincerity is with all that. It's like they're literally just doing that because they think it's good for the money. But in the end, I think they're going to get bitten because it just doesn't make sense. So I will say here, I have been talking to a lot of people behind the scenes in this movement um, that have been working on this longer than I have. And I'm actually doing a lot of homework right now to catch up. I am not the uh, expert that I that I. I guess, aspire to be on this subject. And obviously I've been thrust in this position now where I am <clears throat> drinking from a fire hose just to catch myself up. But yeah. there is a deeper issue than companies just wanting to do this. Um, there are CEOs reaching out to these individuals behind the scenes saying, please come tell me how to get this out of my corporation. And what happens is an instance like um, George Floyd happens and there's outcry from uh, well-intended normal employees saying you need to do something bring in some sort of diversity inclusion training if you want to go hire out external diversity and inclusion training it currently takes one form and that is it they have done such a good job of taking over hr departments and making it where the only people that currently exist that supply this that that supply this um product are critical race theorists and so there is currently a movement, a very necessary movement happening to create the counterpart to this, create a, a movement where not only will we identify where this comes from, how this comes into these institutions, but also identify how, how to get this out of these institutions. And when you hire the, uh, a company to come in and do a, a diverse, a true diversity inclusion training, not a diversity inclusion training that leaves everyone pissed off, resentful, and feeling belittled, um, you will have, I, I think you... Once you supply that, you will have a, a massive demand for it, but it just doesn't exist right now. And that supply needs to also take the form factor of coming in and doing truly anonymous studies 
of these coworkers, giving the ammunition that these CEOs and these companies need to say, I'm going to pull and ask these open-ended questions and do a proper study of how these, these old trainings actually made people feel and what your actual results are from your trainings versus your intentions. And then the next time these types of trainings come up, somebody wants to push critical race theory training, they will be able to pull out that study and point to hard facts and data and say, absolutely not. This will destroy our company. This hurts our bottom line, and it has no place in our diverse and inclusive company. So there's a lot more than needs yeah. to happen. It's a lot more difficult yeah, than I just agree. seeing people, people want this and they're pushing into their own companies. They're absolutely terrified to have this in their companies. They know how destructive it is. They just don't know how the hell to get it out. Yeah.